Pastor Jerry. How you doing? Good. Thanks for doing this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking I forward to it. Appreciate it. Yeah. We're in uh, your church, Radiant Church in Ludington. Yep. Right here on uh, now the neat thing about Michigan, if you don't know anything about Michigan, is we're the only ones that have our state's map on our bodies. And so this is <laughs> Michigan right here. This would be like Grand Rapids and uh, Detroit would be somewhere over here. We're on, we're Ludington, right on, right on Lakeshore. So we're, it's summertime or getting into summertime and we're getting into the beautiful season. We're a resort town, so our, our town triples in the summer. Whoa. And uh, so uh, it's it's a lot of fun, but we're ready uh, towards the end of summer when all the, the visitors go away and we get our quiet little sleepy you know sleepy town back to our to ourselves again. Right. It was a beautiful drive up here, I will say. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of woods on the way up. You kind of feel like you got lost, and then all of a sudden there's this, this city called Ludington, and so uh, it's at the end of the highway. Hmm. So How how'd you end up in Ludington? Yeah, so uh, my wife and I were, were we just celebrated uh, 24 years and of marriage. Uh, we have three kids. Congratulations! Uh, thank you, girl, boy, girl. Our oldest is 16. Our youngest is 12. And uh, uh, before we came here, we've been here for just about 10 and a half years. We were down in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, at a church called Radiant Church, uh, led by Pastor Lee Cummings. He's my pastor. And uh, before that, went to two years of Bible school in Oklahoma, and then uh, grew up at a Resurrection Life Church in Granville, Michigan. And so I've only known three churches my whole life. I'm a Michigander all the way through. Uh, Ludington, uh, as I mentioned, is a resort town. It's got a huge state park. Uh, we used to go camping here as a family. And so I've always loved, like, the, we, we didn't really have a lot of money, so the big thing that we did was camping. So that was, like, our, like that was Disney World, right? Yeah. And so I remember when I was engaged to my wife, Rachel, and we were um, on Lake Michigan kayaking, and we were talking about one day, we don't know how, when, or, you know, we, we don't know how and when, but we're, we're going to pastor a church here in Ludington. And so it took 10 years of working and being trained up and uh, making a lot of ministry mistakes and learning and, and all those kind of things. And uh, then the Lord miraculously opened up a door. So the church that we're at uh, was a church before I got here. Okay. I think it was about six years old, maybe a little bit older than that. It was called Greater Life Church of Ludington. Uh, the founding pastors still to this day, wonderful friends of mine. Uh, they live down in um, Kentucky, planted another radiant church. Uh, they uh, uh, were here preaching. She got sick uh, with cancer, so they went home to uh, to recoup. Um, and uh, praise God, she's she's cancer free and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then two past a pastor came in for two years. Um, so the founding pastors they left pastors for two years. Um, uh, the church was was uh, really really struggling towards the end of that two years. And then uh, we came in. Um, my pastor knew about this. And uh, uh, I actually went to him, and not to take all the time in this, but I went to him after a lot of prayer, went to some men's events that really kind of you know, wrecked my heart in all the right kind of ways. And I just said, listen, I, I, when I first came here 10 years ago, uh, I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to be raised up in that. But we kind of got, not distracted, but life happened. We you know, had three kids and yeah. you know, uh, moved from being a children's pastor to being a tech director and creative arts director. And so just life and busyness happened, and but I felt like it was time to get back to that, to that calling. And um, and I asked him, I said, hey, well, would you take the next two years and lead me and train me and send me out? Hmm. Um, and he asked me, well, where, where would you want to go? And, and I knew of the Radiant Churches, there wasn't one in Lansing. And so I, I said, well, maybe Lansing, we kind of looked at that, but in my heart, I didn't, I know now it was the Holy Spirit, but in the moment I was like, I don't, we don't want to go to heart. Or excuse me, we, excuse me, we don't want to go to Lansing. We want to go to uh, Ludington. If we could ever have a church, we go. We go there. And uh, he had found out two days earlier that the pastors of this church were leaving. What? And uh, none of the pastors left for bad reasons or sinful reasons. Nothing, nothing like no scandals or anything like that. But it doesn't change the fact that by the time that we got here, we were the third pastors in two years. Hmm. And so the church was hurting, full of a lot of good people, but it was it was distracted. It was. Uh, in many regards, stalled out. If anything, it was an, maybe even a nosedive. Financially, momentum, volunteers, vision. Um, we were renting a building that was just a, a disaster. And so we went quite quickly on, a, on a, a, a charge to find the building that we're in now. It's an old Baptist building that we bought and we've been renovating ever since. Yeah. And, um, and it's the year after year after year we've grown. The Lord has really blessed us. And uh, even, even in seasons of like COVID and all that kind of stuff, 
Uh, I think right now, if I'm not mistaken, the average in America, the average church is decreasing by 12 or 13%. Um, and we've, oh. we've not felt that. We've only felt increase on that. And so the Lord has been really faithful uh, to us. My family and I love it here. Uh, it, it's our home. Uh, uh, my wife still wants to go to Florida eventually. <laughs> that's her, her. She likes the warmth. So that's, that's where her vision, her dream one day is to be there. And, uh, but uh, just, you know, raising kids, uh, running a church, and, um, you know, doing the very best that I can. And we, we know how to to. To love the Lord and to grow in that. I mean, we're not we're not called like for me. I'm not called to be a pastor, a husband, and a father before I'm called to be a son of God. And so the, the first things have to be first. The first identity has to be first. And um, if I if I forget that, and let's say the lead pastor identity takes takes charge and takes lead, yeah, uh, things get weird and th things get. Um, uh, you get yourself out from underneath the favor of God and the blessing of the Lord. And uh, so, you know, we're all in, in some regards, and I know this is cliche, but we're, we're all trying to just find our way through life. And yeah. um, I've, I can say that there's been a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of hurtful moments, but mm. the Lord has been with us every step of the way. And so I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> Do you feel yourself sliding into those, like, lead pastor roles like if you don't like how do you stay in the i'm a son of god first yeah you know um it, one, one thing you, you can't believe the hype uh, yeah. uh even if, whether it be your hype about yourself or the hype that other people have good or bad uh, my mom always had this saying it's never as bad as you think it was and it's never as good as you think it was Ooh. and um now she told me that because uh we used to do video and creative arts together and so i would get done filming a video thinking like this is the thing <laughs> No one's ever seen a video this good in their entire lives. And she'd sit down and be like, I was, it was good. <laughs> you know, or I would get done doing something. And I'd be like, I failed. Like, I should never do video again. I'm, I'm just worthless. I got no skills. And she'd come in and be like, oh, no, that's not true. You, you made a few mistakes, but it's, it's, it's still good. And so um, same thing when it comes to our hype. Um, hmm. You know, there's people that will come up and uh, have no problem telling me everything that I did wrong, how I missed the mark. They are very, they are very articulate. They have, they have wonderful words. They have memorized the, uh, uh, the, the source, let's put it that way. And, um, and you, you can't walk away from that, um, believing all of that, but you also can't walk away when someone goes past you, you're the most amazing pastor. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do anything for you. I'll do anything for this church. You have to, you have to remind yourself like, uh, every it, biblical leadership, yeah. The higher you go up in biblical leadership, the more of a servant you must become. Uh -huh. Servant leadership is biblical. What we see outside of the church, but unfortunately, and sometimes even more abusive inside the church, is as someone gains notoriety, they become an influencer, they become someone that uh, has you know um, you know clout, so to speak, right? They're they're getting they're getting invited to conferences and they're getting invited to all these different things. They begin to buy into I'm untouchable, I'm um, uh, I, I'm God's gift to everybody, kind of thing. Yeah. And I I tell people all the time I I, I will never uh, I never want to ask you to do something I'm unwilling today to do. Not like I did it ten years ago. I washed yeah. toilets ten years ago <laughs> when I was an intern. That's why you got to wash toilets. I, I do not ask people to do things today that I'm not willing to do. Um, and that's a part of it. I think a part of it is your prayer life. Uh, um, the, if you're honest with the Lord, uh, what I mean by that is he can handle it. And so if you go to him and just say, God, I'm, I'm really angry about this, or I, I kind of feel like I'm killing it lately. You know, like it's not always bad. Sometimes, honestly, I kind of feel like I'm knocking on the part. But like David said, would you search my heart? Hmm. Would you know my anxious thoughts and ways? And so I think going before the Lord and every once in a while stop talking and actually listen. Yeah. Be slow to speak, quick to listen. Uh, whether it be through a still small voice, through reading of the scripture, maybe some, maybe a, a trusted friend or, or partner uh, in ministry that will come and say, hey, listen, you're doing good, but be careful of this. Watch out for that. Um, he'll speak to you. Yeah. And um, you have to follow suit. You, you have to listen. There's, there's times that I walk away and I genuinely feel like, man, we're, we're finally making ground. I'm like, I, I feel like I'm a real pastor. I feel like I got, you know, the, the people's trust and, and all those things. And usually a very trusted voice in my life will sit down and go, well done. 
but you're not done. Yeah. Like you've done really good here, but maybe you've been pushing the staff too hard or yourself too hard hmm. and you need to course correct it. And it may not just be pace. It might, it might be, um, uh, you know, again, it might be we're sitting here and maybe we get into a season two or three weeks where as a staff or as, as you know, some friends, we start dogging on other churches a little bit, right? Like we're just, we're sitting there, we're drinking coffee and we're like, man, I can't believe that they would have that on their stage. I can't believe they did it that way. And then you, know, you realize, you catch yourself, you realize like, I am, I, what I'm not doing is I'm not saying thank you to the Lord for what he has blessed us with. Yeah. I should be doing that. I should be saying, God where would we be without you? Hmm. Every, every building that we have, every, every resource that's given to us, every person that's here, every, every worship gathering, God, thank you for what you allow us to do. That should be the condition of the heart. But oftentimes we translate that into, I can't believe they down the street do that. Yeah. I, mean, I would never do that. I, I, you know, that's not how you do church. And I just think sometimes we, we, uh, we're so good at self-promotion. Hmm. We're so good at being able to identify the issues of other ministries or churches or people or Christians. Because, I mean, I imagine most people watching this are not lead pastors of churches. This right. is probably an abnormal interview in some regards. Um, we can just, we can buy into uh, our own self-promotion. And, and and I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that you have low self-esteem. Uh but it does mean that you have proper clarity of your identity in Christ. Hmm. See, you, see, we live in this tension. We always do. Any, anything biblical, we live in the tension of, in one hand, I have scriptures that say that I, that I'm a, that I am a sinner, that I'm broken, that even the very best that I can bring compared to God, my righteousness is filthy rags. And so hmm. we live in this, I am worthless. I am such a, like... Oh my gosh, God, why would you give me the time of day? But on the other hand, we have scriptures that say that I'm the righteousness in Christ Jesus. I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so what is it? Is, is God confused? Are we confused? Is it the old, the new? Well, it's actually both. Hmm. So it, 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 what I mean by that is, is um, we absolutely are all of the broken, filthy things that we read about and more. But if we're followers of Jesus... Christians, all of that um, has been forgiven, and we have been, not because we earned it, but we have been given a brand new identity. And so I, I would say this, what, what oftentimes people do is they, they go from the brokenness, they receive the grace gift, and then they begin to buy into the fact that they were always this. Hmm. And I think, I think it's, it's healthy for us to remind ourselves, not that we always look at our past and go, Oh man, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I failed. I'm just such a, you know, low life, you know, uh, you know, why would anybody want to hang out with me? I'm not talking about low self-esteem. I'm talking about saying without Christ, I'm this, I'm nothing. Oh. And so we have no right to stand of our own power and say, look at me, look what, who I am. I've accomplished this. You know, apart from Christ, you can do nothing. And so it's the tension of I am all that he says that I am, but only because of the I am, because of God. Hmm. And the moment we um, I look, I think of it like an extension, like a like a like you have these lights here, yeah, and they're plugged into the wall, yeah. and that's so that, that's AC power, it's getting its power. And you're looking like there's a light. Imagine we're the light, and we're like, man, I'm killing it, man. I'm <laughs> shining bright. You know, I'm called to be a light to the you know light to this to this world, a city set on a hill that can't be hidden. And, we, and we're looking around, man. I've been shining for years, man. People people can see because of me, and uh, not realizing that the only reason people can see because of us is because we're plugged into Christ. Right. So what we do oftentimes as Christians, when we start getting success, we become victims of that success. Hmm. And success doesn't always look like a lead pastor. Success can be you've got people that think your posts on social media are phenomenal, and 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 you know you, I've never understood the Bible until you explained it to me, and and but you buy into that, and what you do is you end up taking the power cable that's plugged into the wall, Christ, and you unplug it and you plug it into yourself because you convince yourself I'm self-sufficient, oh. and what happens the moment you do that you go from light to darkness. Not saying that you become unsaved, but what I'm saying is, is uh, this identity that Christ is giving you, you no longer have the privilege of putting, uh, of fully operating in that because you you have disconnected yourself from Him. 
uh, there, every service, almost every single service before I preach you, if you were to ever watch our live streams or be in our service, I'm, I'm in the front row. Seldom do I actually sing the songs. I love worship, but um, I'm usually in the front row just crying out to God. Hmm. Lord God, would you forgive me? Um, God, uh, will, will you use these words beyond who I am to bring glory and honor to you? God, break me of my pride. I want people to like me. I want people to come to this church and to keep coming back. God, if there is an ounce of that in my heart, will you remove it from me? I want this to be for you. Like I, it, it, Prayers like that are funny because when we say things like, I want it to be all about you, we don't really want it to be all about God. Hmm. We know it should be. And so, so we say things like, God, I want this. Well, not really. What we're really asking God is to help me to want that. Yeah. So I think sometimes we have to just be honest with myself. I find myself and God oftentimes saying, the reality is, God, I don't want it to be all about you. I want it to be about myself, but I know that's sin. And so I am taking that and I'm laying it down and I'm, I'm asking you to once again sit on the throne of my heart and, and be, be enthroned upon my praises. Um, so it's more of an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement that I'm a wicked person, still saved by grace, still loved by God. There's no guilt in that. I, I think a maturing believer is able to live in the tension of that, that says, I am completely forgiven. My sins are not held against me. I am all that he says that I am. There's this great little book, Who I Am in Christ. It's got all these scriptures and uh, you can find these things online. All of that's true. None of it's lacking. But we are not the authors of any of it. Hmm. And the moment we begin to think that we're the author, that's that power cable out of the wall, plugging it into ourself, we have created this doom loop of darkness. Oh. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, especially in America, uh, we see that happening too much um, with pastors and leaders and, and in churches. But honestly, even outside of that, we see it happening with Christians that just, <laughs> I would say this way, get too big for the britches. Hmm. They, they, they genuinely believe that they have everything figured out. I'm telling you right now, if, if you are in a church or an environment where your pastor preaches with an, an air about them of, I have it figured out, uh, run from that church, run from that pastor. Uh, there, there's not a single human being alive that, is, that has been able to figure out the entire Bible. Hmm. Now there's core foundational things that are so simple and so needed and that we can't, we, they're not negotiables. We can't, we can't wrestle with those, at, you know, like at, in order to be ministers of the gospel, regardless of what your platform is. There's, for example, salvation is only through Jesus Christ. If, if you're still struggling with that, it would be better for you to keep quiet and read the scriptures and learn and grow in that before you start posting on, to, you know, on, yeah. on, on social media. Uh, because those are some non-negotiables. We just can't, we, we can differ when it comes to things about, you know, hey, is, is, can you pray in tongues or not pray in tongues? We can differ when it comes to, you know, hey, should, you know, should there be a full band on stage or should it just be a, a piano? There's a lot of things that we can have room and accommodation for. Um, but there are certain things that are being abandoned right now that were core foundational things from the very beginning. Um, and unfortunately, it's being fueled by social media. Hmm. Um, because you rewind back like 20, 20 30 years ago. Uh, I mean, not that I'm old, but I'm old. I'm getting older and um, I'm 40 years old. And I remember being a little kid and when the internet came out, I remember like, you know, dial, yeah. you know, dial up internet and all that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're like, you, know, you went and you, you hit connect to AOL, then you went to the fridge to go make a sandwich and you came back kind of thing. Um, no one had a platform then. Hmm. Major corporations did, news networks did, uh, churches with big television departments. They, they, like a lot of money, those people had influence, right, wrong, or indifferent. And then the internet comes along, and now everybody has a voice. And there's oh. beautiful things about that. I love that. I mean, think about this video right here. Yeah. You are able to come in here, set this up, uh, record this, send this out, and who knows who gets this? It might be one person that watches this. It might. There might be millions. Who knows? Like, you don't know where it goes. Um, times that by just millions of people. Um, you and I would never have had an audience or a platform 20 years ago. Right. Right? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I, I think there's a lot of good that's come out of it. A lot of truth has been exposed. A lot of great options. Like, oh, I didn't know that, that um, 
you know, that, that health tip was out there. I didn't know. I never thought about the Bible that way. I never, oh, that's a great parenting tip. There's a lot of good, but like anything good, there can be bad. Hmm. And now what we have is all of these um, mixed in with the good. You have just rampant false prophets and teachers. Yeah. The word talks about in the end times, uh, and regardless of where you stand on end times theology, the word talks about that uh, there, there's going to be a great falling away, hmm. that people will follow false teachers, they'll have itching ears, and they'll find people that will preach the gospel that they want to hear. And so now people that genuinely have not gone to some sort of training, they've not had their character refined, a lot of them are not under the authority, the spiritual authority of like a godly pastor or church or eldership. Uh, they can just turn the camera on, hit record and look at it. And they can tell you like, well, that's not what the Bible says. It says this, you're an unlearned Christian. Hmm. And, and again, I stand from the perspective that I do not know the entire, the whole Bible. There's things it's knowable. And at the same time, if you know everything, you've painted God into a box and your God is very small. And so yeah. you live in that tension of that as well. And so I think uh, too, there are so many voices, so many teachers and people are getting sucked into it because you have a wound a hurt, an expectation, whatever it is, and then you turn on and you start do, start the doom scrolling. Yeah, you may come across some random person that says, "Oh, you don't have to. You don't even have to go to church. Like it's not, it's not needed. We are the church." Yeah, true. All of you. You go to a church in Grand Rapids. Yep. I'm up here. You and I. We are the church. Capital C. Hmm. We are the body of Christ. But almost everything that the New Testament was written to were to pastors or leaders of local churches at the birth of the of the church and this is just one example at the birth of the church in acts chapter 2 he created both the church where all christians are a part of and he created local churches both are needed both are important but we have thousands and thousands of books and podcasts and blogs and all those things that are telling people not a big deal you don't need that yeah no whatever like you it's just you and jesus you and your boy Right, And it's like, whoa, that's not biblical. And yet people with itching ears go, that's right. I had a bad experience growing up at church. This person's preaching what I like. I'm now following what they have to say. And it doesn't come with the weight of discipline. Hmm. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying that pastors don't fail. I mean, more now than ever before, we're seeing moral failings. We are seeing um, you know, sexual failings and financial failings and, and uh, abuse of leadership and power and I mean, that there, if there is rottenness, if there's rotten things among the ranks, so to speak, among the congregants, there's certainly rotten things among the leaders too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so anyway, that's that's a long, long, long way of saying uh, uh, we need to remain humble. Pride goes before a fall, and um, uh, part of pride is believing a narrative that's just not true about yourself. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because that's like uh, one of the questions I have is how do we discern? Like, because I know that I watch podcasts or listen, yeah. and sometimes I'll hear a teaching that's like totally different than what I heard before. Right. And I'm like, in a way, it's like I talked about being paralyzed before. It's like paralyzing because right. you're like, well, which one am I wrong about everything? Yeah. Well, so again, I actually, I want to be really clear. I do think it's good to have a lot of like rivers, inlets yeah. coming into it. Like, I, I think that's healthy because. It, 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 the only person you ever listen to is your pastor. And mm -hmm. bear in mind, this is coming from a pastor that preaches. That's not a bad thing. But every pastor, myself included, has styles, has perspectives, has things they preach about that they're comfortable with, things they don't preach about they're not comfortable with. So in some regards, it's kind of hard to get a little bit of a healthy diet from listening only to your pastor. Yeah. Uh, which the first antidote to that is read your Bible. Right, so th this this becomes a fundamental problem in the church. If my pastor doesn't preach on end times and I wanna learn about end times, I'm gonna go just Google search end times. There's nothing wrong with that, but I, I would challenge you to slow down first. Hmm. If, if you're feeling there's a deficiency in the preaching or of what's covered, um, you as a disciplined disciple, go to your word, Yeah. slow down, open it and read what it has to say. I tell people all the time in our services, do not take my word for it. Whatever I just preached, I'm, I'm pleading with you, go home, open your Bible and judge what I have said according to the word of God. And if what I have said does not line up, ignore it. 
Yeah. If it does, then run with it. Um, any pastor that would even have a hint of, you know, I'm the Lord's messenger and, and brother, you know, what I say goes. Uh, I mean, there's a truth in there that you are a messenger from the Lord, but man, like it, he, we're human. We can mess it up. We can miss the mark. We can add, we can preach 90% truth, but add 10% humanity into it. And, and, and uh, if, if this glass were water and that's all truth, and I were to take a droplet of like, like two drops of arsenic, yeah. I'm not sure you're going to want to drink Whoa, that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like 99% of it's water still, but I'm not sure you're going to be really like, yeah, give me that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you know what I mean? Um, and so you asked, how do you discern between what? Um, so first we must be people of the word. And we don't like it because for some of us, it's so boring and we, we want that secret fix. Hmm. Just tell me that secret sauce. If I put a little bit of this in my, in my Christian walk, if we're being honest, that, that re- alleviates me from the responsibility of reading my Bible. Whoa. And so what are some of those things look like? Well, one of those things is I just got to go find a teacher that can make it understandable for me. Oh. And, and again, I'm all for it. I preach every single Sunday. Uh, I'm all for having people read the word and do their best to just, to, to just unpack it. Uh, I think there's a that's one of the gifts of 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 God to the church. Uh, he actually says that the fivefold ministry gifts, one of which is teacher, one of which is prophet, and there's an evangelist and um, pastor and and so forth, uh, an apostolic um, leader is uh, that actually says this is a gift to the church. So I do believe pastors and leaders are messengers from the Lord and they're there to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. But my job is to not feed you information. My job is to equip you to go do ministry, hmm. right? If someone says your job pastor is uh, to do the finances of the church or to, to build this or do that, I would say it's a part of it. Uh, but, even, but, but, it's, but my report card if it's gonna have A's on the report card of my job, it has to be that there are people in our church that are now themselves engaged in ministry, not Jerry Tice does ministry and they come and watch. Right. So, ministry is not a spectator sport and yet we've turned it into that. And, and part of what feeds that is this uh, information culture that we have. So if you, if you were to look at Christianity in America primarily, like Western Christianity versus the rest of the world, um, by and large, I'm, I'm painting with a very broad stroke brush here. So the, the, there's a lot of outliers in this, but uh, the American Christian church in particular is, has information-based discipleship. Okay. What I mean by that is, is we have bought hook, line, and sinker that we need more information and more information will produce discipleship. Mm. So what do we do? We, we go to church. We do the podcast, the blog, the, the social media. We share, we post, we, we, we buy the latest and greatest book that's out there. We do book studies in community groups together. Uh, we go to conference. It, it's just consume, 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 consume. And it's, a lot of it's good stuff. Yeah. It's a lot of it's like, oh, this really is manna from heaven. This is so good. Um, but uh, that's not how the rest of the world, that's not how the rest of Christianity, especially historical Christianity, has operated. Uh, it's been more obedience-based discipleship. So let me compare and contrast here. So America is all the things I just mentioned. It's yeah. just consume and somehow all of that consumption will produce something good. It doesn't by and large, but that's what we believe. Whereas you, let's say, go over to Africa or you go over to some place, especially pers- the persecuted church, and they don't have anything that we have. Hmm. They, they don't have version on their phone, the Bible app. They, they don't have a lot of times the Bible that they can just hit play and listen to the audio Bible of it, right? They don't, they don't have a the click of a button, an expansion that comes up that gives you all the commentary and just, you would think if Americans had all this stuff to them, that we would be the most righteous, godly group of people that has ever existed since the, in 2000 years of church history. Right. Yet we're not. Over an obedience-based discipleship models, uh, and they don't even think of it as a discipleship model. It just is. This is what they do. Like, let's say you and I are sitting down. Maybe there's two or three other people here, and we would open our Bibles, and, and all of a sudden it says, it says, uh, Jesus Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about uh, turn the other cheek. Hmm. Well, we're not we're not blasting through that chapter to check the box that we read that chapter. Right. We're stopping at the end of that. We're going, okay, we need to talk about that. I don't like that. I don't like that I have to turn the other cheek because I don't want to be abused. And I don't want that to turn into something that's not. And I'm not going to preach that message, but 
you begin talking about it, you begin wrestling with it. And a lot of times in these churches, they will not move on to the next chapter, the next verse even, the next lesson, until their members of their church, whether it be a small church or a large church, are actually doing that. And you can time, you can add that from how we deal with our enemies through prayer and, and, and blessing them to finances in the church to um, sexuality and, and honoring the Lord with our bodies. I mean, you, like any topic that, that they'll take a lifetime to go through the Bible. Hmm. But here's what they get to. They realize the words of Jesus saying, don't call me Lord if you don't do what I say. Don't say that you love me if you disobey my commandments. This is what Jesus says. And yet we'll stand here in our services and we'll raise our hands saying, Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. And we'll disobey his commandments all day long. And we'll have reasons and excuses and we'll have people that will come alongside us, create echo chambers. Mm. It's okay, you're okay, don't worry about it. They just don't understand what you're going through and God's all this and God has grace and I'm so thankful for the mercy of God. But at the end of the day, if we are not obedient to his word, then we're not disciples. And we're not, we will never walk in the blessing. But even before that, let, let, let's say, let's say that, you know, you, I mean, you live in Grand Rapids, I'm here. So we're not like buddies, right? I mean, right. I've, I've seen you before, we've talked before, but let's just say, man, last 20 years, you, you and I have been tight. Like that's like, we've gone through life, yeah. right? We like, I know all your secrets. You can take me down. I can take you down. Like, you know, ride or die for life, right? And then all of a sudden you just stop talking to me, hmm. right? Um, and I'm like, man, why is he not, he's not connecting with me. And, and, and I call you up, I'm like, hey, listen, I noticed this in your life. Like, I really feel like if you keep doing this thing, it's gonna hurt you. And you ignore me and you just keep doing it. Hmm. Um, and then but this goes on for like a year. At some point, you've damaged our relationship. Right. At some point, I no longer believe we're friends. I no longer can trust you. I can no longer lean on you. I don't have to be mad at you. I don't have to have hatred in my heart or, or hold unforgiveness and bitterness, but you have severed the relationship. And I, and I wonder how many of us believers are walking around wanting to be disciples because we like how it sounds. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Really? Because there's not a lot of fruit. Jesus, God, God tells us that we not only can, but we should judge a tree by its fruit. Hmm. This gets confusing in the Bible because we have other scriptures that say things like, don't judge, lest you be judged. Right. Well, it's, it, it, there's a difference between Christian to Christian and the rest of the world. The Bible says, do not judge the rest of the world. What business do we have judging them? That's between them and the Lord. Right. But judgment begins in the household of the Lord. Judgment, and so we, we, we try to create these churches and these environments and these expressions that come as you are, no pressure, you do you, go at your pace, and I'm right here to support you. And I, granted, I think that's how we should be on the front end, as just as loving and welcoming every, like here at Radiant, everyone is welcome. Even if your life does not line up with what we believe to be true in the Bible, everyone's welcome. I'll, I'll wrap my arms around anybody. I'll pray with you. Come on, like, let's go get some coffee. Um, Jesus did that, right? Jesus ate with the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes. But this is where people get it wrong. You don't see scriptures where Jesus keeps going back and hanging out with them. Hmm. And then, and then even does the things like Jesus didn't go shake down people and steal money from them. Right. Right. Jesus didn't become a sinner. Jesus didn't sleep with the prostitutes. In fact, when we, we, we see the story of the woman at the well, she's caught in the act of adultery. She's going to be stoned. She's going to be killed. And Jesus gives this phenomenal challenge to people. If you have no sin, go ahead and throw a stone. Hmm. And then slowly but surely people walk away. The stones drop, and this, and he said, "Hey, listen, where are your accusers? No one, none." And he says, "No, then I don't accuse you. I don't condemn you." And uh, just this beautiful exchange. People stop right there. Jesus is love. Jesus is like, all accepting. There, to, but then the next words that Jesus says is, "Go and sin no more." Right. So if we actually want to be followers of Jesus, we have to be a hundred percent both, a hundred percent grace, a hundred percent truth. Jesus was both. Actually, there, I can't remember the verse off the top of my head, but it says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Hmm. 
But what we have done in America, especially in American Christianity, is we have pitted those two things against each other. Yeah. Hey, well, that was kind of harsh. You need to have more grace. Or, oh, you need to have a little bit more truth. You haven't, you haven't given enough truth. Jesus did not operate in a balance of grace and truth. It, you can't find a scripture that says Jesus only shared 50% truth so that he could have 50% grace. It says that he was full of grace and truth. As believers, if we want to be disciples ourselves, because it starts with us, judgment begins in the house of the Lord first, in churches, in connections, brother to brother in Christ, and personally, it begins with us long before we start going and telling other people their business. Mm. Um, remove the plank out of your eye before I try to remove this speck out of somebody else's. We have, to, we have to treat ourselves the same way Jesus treated us. Jesus, I need your grace. I sinned. I, I've, I have messed up. Will you forgive me? And know that he gives that to us. So that's the grace. Jesus doesn't condemn us like he didn't condemn the woman at the well. But then we also have to take the truth pill that says, Jesus says, go and sin no more. Stop doing this. Repentance is turning from what you're doing. Not. I heard a pastor say this way. Um, as Christians and as pastors, we are not called to... Um, to to, to turn our churches and our gatherings uh, into a uh, very comfortable deathbed. Mm. Uh, or in other words, we just got to medicate people and help them to feel comfortable as they die. We are called to preach and live the truth vividly, boldly, calling people to, to task on sin while loving them greatly, grace and truth. We're called to do that so that people can break free from the deathbed and the things that weigh them down and ensnare them. But what we do, because we don't want to deal with our own stuff, and we don't want people in our business, because I don't want you calling me out, I'm not going to call you out. Whoa. And so we'll stand next to each other, hands raised in church, we'll take communion together, and all the while I know that what you're doing is destroying your life, but I don't care about you enough to expose that the right way, biblically, not in the wrong, abusive, I'm never for dragging someone before everybody and embarrassing them, but... Mm. I'm not going to call you out because I don't want to get called out. It's just better for us to live our own lives. Discipleship should be obedience-based discipleship. Hold on a moment. That right there said that I have to forgive. Well, I don't want to forgive that person. The Bible says if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. And now you have to wrestle with that. And then don't lie to yourself. Are you obedient to what you have been, what's been revealed or disobedient? Hmm. We lie to ourselves and say, like, I'm just struggling with that right now. I'm working on that. And granted, we're always in process. But there is something to be said about just saying, actually, I'm disobedient. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm processing through that. And I'm trying, uh, I'm, I know that I know that this is truth. I am not lined up with truth. And I need, in our example, brothers in Christ to come alongside me and challenge me, encourage me, and help me to walk the path of righteousness. Th that's how we become disciples. I, I, we don't need to fatten ourselves up anymore. Mm. We don't need to only consume. We need to be obedient to what we know. The word tells us that if we know what to do and we don't do it, to us it's sin. Yeah. So the church is riddled with sin because we know so much. Yeah. Does it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like knowledge is power, but knowledge is also damning too. Right. And the church is walking around puffed up with knowledge, but we're not living it out. And we're hypocrites uh, oftentimes. I am too. I, I, I have the same struggles as the, as the next person, but I, do, I give myself a short leash. I, or I, I keep myself on a short leash rather. Um, the, the, if, you could, if you could peer into my prayer life, it, it, you would hear a very raw, very respectful, but raw conversation with the Lord. God, I don't want to give this sin up. I like it. But I know you're telling me, I, and, but I, I feel powerless to give it up. I need your help. Will you bring someone into my life that will strengthen me, that will walk this out with me, that will hold me accountable? Th those are dangerous prayers. Yeah. But that's the prayer of a disciple. D does that make sense? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm a huge sense. talker. I know. Sorry, Audi. I've given him no time to talk. My bad. Like, no, I'll, this, I'll start, like, this yeah. is exactly what I think yeah. we all need, and we like to hear from people who uh, have been walking with Christ a long time. Like I told you, we share a lot of testimonies, and it's maybe right. believers who have just become believers. So I think this is a godsend yeah. to hear you talk. But and it, and it doesn't mean that we're not loving. Like, oh my gosh, 
Jesus loved me. He went to leopards, the people that were diseased, that were d d d the whole community dismissed. And he touched them. Hmm. He loved them. So I, I don't want anybody to hear this kind of aggressive, abusive. It's not that. Jesus was able to do both. And then he told us to go in his name and do likewise. Hmm. And so it would be very abusive for God, uh, almost like a cruel joke, for him to tell us to go do this if we were not able to, even though on a smaller scale, if we were not able to accomplish it. The only way that we're able to do it is because he sent the helper, the, the Holy Spirit, God himself, to reside on the inside of us. And we read in Acts chapter 2 that when we received the Holy Spirit, that's when the church was born. That and one of the first things that happened was a boldness to preach the gospel. Thousands of people got saved in one message of Peter. And it wasn't because of Peter, it was because the Holy Spirit empowered him to do what he was unable to do. In my weakness, the strength of God is made known. I just, uh, truthfully, I think real disciples have to become very acquainted with, continually, with being weak. We don't like weakness. It's a dirty word in, in, in our culture. It, 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 weakness translates into being taken advantage of. Weakness translates into uh, passiveness and not. Weakness is a beautiful thing. Well, to not I want to call it, weakness is not low self esteem. Hmm. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm a piece of crap. That's not that's not, that's not weakness. Right. Weakness is not letting evil reign. What's that saying? It's something like all. All evil needs is for good people to do nothing. It's something like that. I, I misquoted it. But weakness is not allowing sin to reign. Weakness is acknowledging to God that apart from you, I'm nothing. With you, I'm everything. God, I don't have the truth. I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I need your help. I need direction. I need strength. Holy Spirit, if you do not show up on this and lead and guide me as you were told, I was told that you would do. If you don't do that, this is going to fail. Hmm. Um, there's this preacher, I, he's the, this is years and years ago. It wasn't here. It's just a story I heard, uh, uh, pastor of the largest church in the world, uh, over in China, uh, I think it was China. And he came over here and he toured the United States and was a red carpet tour, right? Like everyone rolled up and our guest speakers here and I'll do all that. And they asked, one of the pastors asked him like, what shocked you about America? Or what, what was your observation? And this is what he said in, in short. He said, I'm amazed at how much the American church can do without the, without the Holy Spirit. Whoa. That's the problem. We can go into our church services, our prayer gatherings, our summer camps, our men's events, our community groups. We can go into these things and pull off great services without ever praying, hmm. without ever saying, God, if you literally were to tell us right now to do nothing but just sit and be quiet, we'll do that. A willingness to say, God, take over. God, have your will, have your way. I've done it. I'm, I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of showing up on Sunday at times and like, all right, I got my message. I'll preach it. Hmm. Let's do this thing. I got, I, cause I got a, I got a meeting afterwards. I got to get to, well, you have service and people get blessed and there's some good things that happen, but the, the early church didn't have that luxury. They didn't have, I mean, they had, some of them had buildings, but I mean, they didn't have what we have here. I mean, they didn't, we're sitting in a little creative art studio so that Great. once a month, my team and I can sit here and sip coffee and talk about how we're going to advertise the next events. I mean, hmm. this is, this is not what the early church experienced. Um, I'm thankful for it. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it's, it, these things, these are tools that help us, but man, you know, sometimes I'll put it this way. Sometimes it's good that the power goes out. Hmm. You've ever been, a, I was just at a, a, a conference, really good conference. Uh, tornado came. And uh, three times they, we all had to go to the hallway and sit in the hallway. So like one of them was in a main session, it's supposed to be you know big worship team. And it's like the closing session. All of a sudden the alarms go off and we got to go in the hallway. And, um, and they were just in the hallway and they just started worshiping. I got, there's this video online of just, just singing the, the the songs that don't require lyrics, right? You know, yeah. how great is our God, and you know, um, you know, coming back to the heart of worship, those kind of songs, and um, just beautiful. Uh, when I say sometimes it's good for the power to go out, that same building I used to work at, power would go out all the time, and when I go out, I get so mad, like, oh no, we had this video intro and, and we had this really cool thing planned, and 
sometimes those are the most beautiful moments when you have to just open some windows and doors and go, I don't got a sound system. Let's just get together and sing. Hmm. Um, but you find out really quick if you are tolerating the Holy Spirit or you're celebrating the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And I think a lot of Christians maybe even go into their gatherings tolerating the Holy Spirit. If he shows up, if I agree with it, okay. Versus God, I don't want to be here. Like Moses said, I, and when they're in the wilderness, if your presence does not go with us, if you're not with us, we're not moving. We'll die in this wilderness if you're not with us. Right. I think we have to have that. I think every morning when we wake up and you're in the shower or you're drinking your coffee or whatever whatever your routine is, I, I think it has to be met with um, not my will but yours be done. I can't accomplish anything. I mean, we have enough problems today, the Word tells us, let alone being worried and anxiety about tomorrow. And we need we need to be weak. Hmm before the Lord, and then he can exalt us, then, then he can strengthen and, and guide us, but only, only when we allow ourselves to say, God, again, not in a low self-esteem, because th th those are two totally different things, but God, I need you. Hmm. I, I just need you. I need you to be a dad and a parent. I need you to be a good husband. I need you to be a friend of that person I don't like. I, I, God, apart from you, I'm lost. Um, if you maintain that, if, if that is your rhythm, along with gratitude, because I mean, baked in that is gratitude, right? Like, it's not just God, I'm, I need you, I'm lost. It's God, look what you've done. Thank you for breath in my lungs. Sometimes mm. if you have nothing else to thank God for, thank God for salvation and that you have breath in your lungs and you woke up today. Like, you said your mercies are new every morning. Lord, I don't personally feel it, but I want to say thank you that I woke up in your brand new mercies today. Hmm. Gratitude and humility, those two things, if you will remain in that place, many of the trappings that we see Christians of small platforms and large platforms uh, get trapped, get caught into, many of them will disappear because when you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and your heart is quiet before him and you'll listen, he'll tell you, you're doing a good job, but you're getting a little bit too focused on your clothes. Hmm. Or you're doing, like, I'm really proud of you, but you're getting a little bit snippy with your wife. You're like, what, why, why, why are you so angry? And, and then you have to deal with it. Then that comes back to obedience-based discipleship. I'm not going to run off and go read 25 books about end times when the Lord's dealing with me about why I'm, I'm not being polite and kind to my wife. I have to deal with the disobedience in my life. I think where we get off track is when we lose gratitude and we lose and we become prideful. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think even you hearing you say that is like sort of convicting, you know, because sometimes I can look into details and get thrown off my path. Yeah. We all do, though. Yeah, we all have our thing. I mean, I'm not immune to this. Hmm. By the way, I did not put arsenic in your water. You can drink. <laughs> you can drink it if you want to. Appreciate it's you. not poison. I promise. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think those things are important. They're not, it doesn't make you immune to sin. It doesn't mean that you, there's no way you could ever have an affair. Or there's no way that you could ever steal or, or fall into, you know, gross, unrepentant sin. It's just, it's just a really good heart check um, every single day. It's kind of like, um, it's like vehicle maintenance, hmm. right? So like, if you go out to your vehicle and uh, I, I, I get, I, I, uh, indicator light on my dashboard drives me nuts. Yeah. It's different for like other people I know. Mine stays on. Yeah, they're like, oh, it's like a Christmas tree. There's lights everywhere. Like, I'm honestly, can I get another light? Right. right. Let's see what happens. Like, for me, if the engine light's on, oh, it's, I hear people say, it's always on. My brain short circuits because it's like, and I don't know anything about cars. I can't fix them to save my life, but I just go, well, how am I going to know if it's really broken? Mm. And so if there's a light on, I'm immediately getting it fixed. I mean, the, I'm on the phone, mechanic, I don't know what it is. It says something about my blinker fluid is low. I need, I need help. And uh, I'm joking, obviously. Uh, but <laughs> it's like maintenance in the vehicle. So when you own a vehicle, you can have perfect a perfect maintenance record. And it still doesn't guarantee that the engine won't break down and the tires won't deflate. But you have a much higher chance of a successful tr path and a successful drive if you stay up on the oil change, tire pressure, 
filter change out and all that kind of stuff. And I think we have a lot of Christians that are running around with every sin dashboard indicator and disobedience dashboard indicator on, and they're wondering why they're not making, why we're not making it to the finish line. Why pastors and leaders and Christians and, and, and students are not, are not getting all the way through their life and going to be here one day when they die. Well done, good and faithful servant. They're, we have people that are burning out and deconstructing. That's a whole other topic, and there's some good reasons to deconstruct. Mm. Uh, that's a whole other topic. It could be you know, episode two. Um, you know, but by and large, the overall deconstructing um, that's going on is not good. It, it may have elements that are, are reformation for the church that bring us back to a more, in some regards, a more pure motive, a more pure pursuit, but it's surrounded by so much rebellion and lack of humility to the Lord and to the Word of God. Um, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You and I were talking off camera before this. Uh, like if you were to come to our church, we have a lot of equipment, a lot of production. We are very good with service orders. We know we are smooth about it. Like, like we are polished. This generation is kind of getting sick and tired of that kind of stuff. Mm. And I'm recognizing that I'm kind of finger to the wind going, oh, there's, there's a change. We, you know, we need to be mindful of it. But the antidote to the sin that has crept into the church is not to swing the pendulum and throw the baby out the bathwater and go, we don't need church. We don't need any of this stuff. Let's just go, you know, let, let's just go in the woods and just between me and Jesus. Hmm. I, I think sometimes we attach the problem, or the real problem, excuse me, the real problem to the wrong thing. Okay. The real problem is because we got lights. No, it's not. The real problem with the church is because we have, uh, you know, we have, we have, you know, really big, expensive buildings. It's not a problem. It certainly is be worth talking about. I think there's imbalance in, in all the things that, we, in a lot of the things that are done in the church. But those should be just be healthy, good conversations. What people do is they walk in and go, people aren't loving. They don't care. They've made it all about themselves. So skip all of this. Peace out. I'm going to go somewhere else. And they they have. Because they've mis, uh, mislabeled the problem, they also mislabel the solution. So if the problem is production and the show and you know just building my church and having more events, if they mislabel the problem, then they'll swing to the other side and they'll mislabel the solution that goes, well, then we don't need church. We don't need large gatherings. We don't need to do any of that stuff. We don't need to give to the church to serve. We don't need to have pastors. We don't need to be under spiritual authority. And they'll, they'll throw everything out mm. because they mislabeled the problem. The problem is, is we're not being disciples. We're not making disciples. And discipleship starts with humility and gratitude. Um, and I guess I mean, maybe the third element there, discipleship starts with being with people. Hmm. And I, I just believe this, that authenticity, which is what this generation wants. And I, I'm, I'm not in this coming generation. I'm 40 years old. I'm an, I'm an elder millennial, right? I'm not, I'm not here. But what this generation wants is a more, is, is genuine connection with a spiritual being. Right. Some of them will say with Jesus, most will say, I just, I want to, I just want real. I want real relationships with other people and I want real relationships with a higher being. What we have done a disservice to as leaders of churches in particular, but also movements and conferences and all those things is we have not done a good job showing people that you can be excellent. You can't, if you read the Bible, there's excellence all the way through it. The old covenant, the new, everywhere through, God is actually very meticulous about having skilled musicians and having um, certain materials and, and environments being set. He's actually like the purest form of environmentalist. Like Jesus, God loves cultivated environments, though he can also work in sheds. Like God, God is able to, to work in both and has value for both. Um, we've done a terrible job of saying we can have these things and still genuinely love and surrender to God and care for other people. And so because people haven't felt those things, they, they see the hypocrisy. They see that we're not reaching out to people and loving them the way that Christ truly did with grace and truth. They go, burn down the establishment mm. and let's go in the woods and create something brand new. And there's such an immaturity to that perspective I tell people in our church, I, I, maybe I'm the only one that does this. I don't know, but I tell people, if there are things that we're doing wrong, 
please come and talk to me about it. Let's mm. pray through it. Let's wrestle with it. There's so many times I go before the church and I, and I just say, hey, reality is, guys, I got off course and I'm sorry. And we're doing a course correct. Mm. I, I got stressed or I got distracted. I'm so sorry this caused you heart hurt. Let, let's, this is what truth is. This is where we need to be. Let's go. That's what we need. We need leaders of God not to abandon their post or be canceled. We need leaders of God, by and large, unless it's just gross sin, to humble themselves and go before people and say, as imperfect as I am, this is what I know to be true. Will you forgive me? Let's move forward. And let's have grace and mercy for each other. But because we have such a celebrity culture, uh, we, we, we both prop up and kill our pastors at the exact same time. Mm. you're the man of God you're amazing you're like you can do no fault we have these celebrity pastors all over the world that we follow they have millions of people that they follow they got budgets and they got buildings they got all these things and we prop them up and then when they make a mistake we murder them yeah. we stab them and now bear in mind I, I want to be really clear like I'll, I'll give you an example if I if I get into an affair in a, uh, with a relationship with somebody else in my opinion I should be removed from the lead pastorship of this church Hmm. I, th th there's a difference between restoring the person to God and restoring the person to the position. Oh. Okay. And now some of them, like, kind of, you know, kind of depends on what the crime is, so to speak, right? And it depends on their level of influence. I mean, I've, I've had it where I, I messed up early on in my, my ministry time. I wasn't the lead pastor. I was, I was over uh, children's ministry. And they corrected me and they pulled me back and they, they, they did church discipline to me. And slowly but surely, they brought me back into levels of, of leadership and, and new roles. And they allowed me to do some things, but not everything. And I'm so thankful that I didn't take that discipline and reject it and run. I took the beating because I knew they loved me and I knew they were men of God. And it shaped who I am today. But we got a generation that sees the injustice, sees the brokenness, and instead of being a part of the solution, they run and, like I said, they, they, they blow up the bridge and they go try to make their own things. The problem with that is that we have a generation of people who, have, who do have wisdom that are older than us. And if we don't listen to them of what works and what doesn't, and maybe not everything they say is true, we are, gonna, we are doomed to repeat the exact same mistakes and we're going to be just as painful and hurtful to other people that they were to us. Hmm. We have to be willing to say they didn't have it figured out. We don't have it figured out. This next generation doesn't have it figured out. But can we... Can we be honest and assess exactly where we're at and without pride, and without trying to defend ourselves, just say, we screwed up. God, would you forgive us? We repent of our wicked ways. Um, it was like Second Chronicles, I think, um, 7, 14, talks about if my people who hear my voice, if we will humble ourselves, Repent, turn from our wicked ways. Not only will he forgive us, but he will heal our land. Our land, our people, our families, our community, our churches need healing. And the way that we receive healing is not by creating a brand new entity and podcasts and, and conferences around this brand new deconstructing concept. The way we do it is by getting in the trenches and going, some of this is a mess and we need to pick it and clean it up. And it's better to do it from within if there is a if there's an open door. Sometimes there isn't. Hmm. Sometimes church leaders are like, we're not having any of it. And then maybe you do need to leave. I, I get that. But then find a church where the where the leadership team is humble and they can take correction and they can take input. We did a <laughs> one of the best and worst decisions I've ever made. Uh, uh, we did a, um, a church-wide survey last year, and a big one. Like It was a lot of questions. <laughs> sent it to everybody, people that don't even go to our church anymore. We just sent it to, like, if you've been in Radiant Church for the last five years, we're sending it to you. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. I, first of all, out of the woodwork, I'm getting all my pastor friends and staff members of previous churches text me, are you insane? <laughs> what are you doing? Why would you open yourself up to that? Like, What good could possibly come from this? Uh, i tell you what, it was brutal. Was it? It was hard to hear. I, I, the, weeping, reading some of these things. Some encouraging. But most of it was encouraging. But the things that were hard, they were hard. Uh, my assistant, I asked her to go through and, and um, add them all up and divide them by the ministry so each ministry head could get, like if I'm in charge of worship, I could get the worship comments. Hmm. And one day I walked past and she's just crying in her office. And I'm like, what's what happened? Who did this to you? Like, <laughs> give me a name, right? I'll go fight the good fight. And, she's, and I realized she's reading the comments. Um, that was hard for us as a staff and I wanted to run from it and I was angry and I was like, who are these congregants? They don't know how hard we work. They don't know 
how much we love and we, we love them. <laughs> you know, you know, so you can say it like these stupid people, they don't know how much we love them. Like, <laughs> but then I realized I stopped and realized like, or, or maybe there's some truth. Mm. Maybe most of it isn't true. Maybe they're mean, the tone they use, the approach they use could have been a lot better, but Lord, what if there's truth in this? And I, so I gave it to our team and I asked him, I said, I, I need you to read this through the lens of not that you're a failure or that your job's in jeopardy. I need you to read this through the lens of God, is there any truth to this? Hmm. And then I actually did a live stream in front of the church and we talked through the top, I think it was top 10 questions and I answered them. And some of them were like, you know what church, you're right. We failed at this and we need to do better and we will. And this is how we're going to, this is the initial plans of how we're going to get better. Some of them, I just slapped the church a little bit. Hmm. You guys come at it with this. Uh, I hear this all the time. You're wrong. And here's why. If we're not willing to have conversations, brother to brother, brother to sister, um, then we are just perpetuating the same thing that was handed down to us. Mm. My way, the highway, get on board or get out. I think most people aren't willing to have the conversation. Uh, the leadership's not willing to hear it or people that do have a genuine perspective are not willing to go through the pain of possibly hearing they're wrong. Um, both of us need to get off our high horses and come together and just have a conversation. Does that make, is that yeah. Do you feel like there was some healing in that, by the way, from the church? Like what, what came about? Because Once we did the live stream, it did. Because yeah. what that did is allowed us to acknowledge how frail we were. But it also allowed us at this, remember I talked about humility, but the second part was gratitude. It allowed us to acknowledge how well we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's not just about being down in the dirt with humility. Uh, humility is not about low self-esteem. It's about submitting to Christ. Humility is you say, go, I'll go. You say, stop, I'll stop. So it was that element. But then it was also to say, the reality is guys, of all of the questions and all the comments and pushback that came in, not one of them was that we are not loving. Hmm. or that we have abandoned scripture, or that we, we don't care about the poor and disenfranchised and those that are marginalized. Like there's a, even in the pain, there's a celebration. Yeah. Gratitude and humility, I, I think would probably be building blocks, foundational key cornerstone building blocks of how to be a disciple and eventually how to make disciples. Hmm. Yeah, it's cool to see that it was constructive and that it came to a, a positive It end. wasn't going to be at first. I was about <laughs> ready to burn the church down myself. I was like, all right, that's it. You don't appreciate me. I'm going somewhere else. You know, it was one of yeah. those moments. But yeah, you got you to gotta get before the Lord on those things. Yeah. And, um, and, and then somehow not walk away feeling like you're a complete failure. Remember, it's never as bad as you think it is. Yeah. It's also never as good as you think it was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it's... Man, we humans are such weird, fickle little beings. We, yeah. we even uh, the older and more mature we get, we think we got it figured out. We never have it figured out. You right. should always be a student of Christ. You should always be the. <laughs> do your best to make sure you're not the smartest person in the room. Hmm. If you're the smartest person in the room, then you're the apex. And uh, what are you going to learn? Right. And sometimes the smartest person in the room, and what I mean by that is, w when it comes to you and Christ. You need to walk in and go, you're not trying to educate Christ. Holy Spirit, through your word, through your voice, take me to school. Right. Let's go to school. Hmm. I'm a student. I'm sitting down. I got my calculator. I got my pencil. Let's go. And, you know, I think that's just what the Lord's calling us to in this season. And that is, by the way, the most radical thing that we could do right now. The most radical thing is not to 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 build buildings, not to, I mean, the, the things I'm going to list are all good things. Yeah. But they're not the, they're not the most impactful things building buildings and campuses and brand new ministries and, and, you know, starting schools of ministry. Like these are all, praise God, they're all tools. The most radical thing you or I could ever do is to be a Christian that does exactly what I just mentioned and lives in the world, be in the world, but not of it. Hmm. Because the world is incredibly prideful and everyone's out for themselves and they, they, they want to only be heard and never listen. And if we can walk around like Jesus, he was so gentle. And there's times where he was so violent. Hmm. Jesus is whipping and flipping tables over in the temple when he needs to. But then he's holding little children when he needs to. He's able to walk into the room and not be a thermometer only. A thermometer walks in. A thermometer is put in an environment and it changes to the environment. It, it, it reflects. If the room is 72, it reflects 72. Hmm. A thermostat first 
has to read the room. Oh, it's 72 degrees. And then it sets the room at 70. Whoa. That's what we're called to do as Christians. We can't walk in and, and just bulldoze people over. We got to read that. Oh, you don't need a message right now. You just need someone to hug you. Hmm. Oh, you, you don't, you don't need a, a lecture on tithing today. We could talk about that later, but today you just need someone that will take a walk with you and, and, and be willing to maybe share some scriptures with you today as an encouragement. We have to read the room, but then by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit with grace, humility, and gratitude, we have to set the tone. That's what we need to be. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. We got to set the tone. Uh, Pastor Jerry, thanks so much for doing Absolutely. this. Absolutely. I, I, it's been great. <laughs> yeah. I, I was wondering if maybe like uh, if there was one step or one thing you would share like as new believers, like what can we do, like a practical next step to just get deeper with God or? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good ones. Okay. I'll give, you, I'll give you two real quick ones. There's a really good book by Jimmy Evans. Pastor Jimmy Evans, it's 10 Steps Toward Christ. Hmm. There's a lot of books out there like that, but it's, it is a, it's, it's, I call it like street language. It's very clear. Like if you're a new believer, here are 10 really good steps you can take. They're, they range from things like uh, get baptized to reading your Bible to Christian fellowship. So that's, it, it, it really breaks down the basics. Okay. Really great book. They have an audible version. They have a printed version. Um, we actually have a ton of them here and we just give them away to new believers. So that's one. The next one is, and this one's harder. Hmm. This one's not as easy because uh, it takes a lot of time, humility, commitments, all that stuff. I truly believe that we were designed for community. Hmm. And, and when I say community, I don't just mean be surrounded by people because you can be in a room surrounded by a thousand people and be incredibly lonely and isolated. I've felt that before. Yeah. That's one of the downfalls of social media. You can have millions of followers and have not one person that at your deepest, darkest hour you could actually reach out to and they will be there on your doorstep to, to carry you through the darkness hmm. into light. Um, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is, I mean, again, for guys to have Christian brothers, girls to have Christian sisters. <clears throat> uh, and I'm not talking about a ton. Sometimes it's just two or three. Uh, sometimes that's actually better, right? Yeah. Because it's hard to keep 12 people up to date with what's going on in your life. Yeah. But if you have one or two people that they know, they can read your mail. They know they know everything about you. They, and, and by the way, they're godly men. These are not just buddies. Oh, I got a best friend and he's really funny. I'm not talking about that. Like, that's great. Have your best friend who's hilarious. I'm talking about someone that has been there, done that, has some victories that can look at you and look in your life and go, Hey, I need to tell you something that's going to be hard for you to hear, but I'm willing to walk with you. You can only truly minister to people at the speed of, of relationship hmm. and commitment. Uh, and so I'm not saying walk around, find three people in the church and be like, you're mine now. I have no relationship with you. Speak into my life. You got to spend time with them. You got you to know their life. They got to know yours, but then listen to them. The Lord tells us in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. And I'm telling you from 10 years of leading this church, the people that are still in the game, that are still loving the Lord and running full force for him are the ones that they appreciate the messages, but where they get the most practical, life-giving, sustainable um, transformation is among their brothers in Christ two or three, and you have to fight for it because it doesn't come natural. You might have to go through a few people until you find that one or two that works. Yeah. Not every person you walk up to is going to be the home run. Sometimes we try once or twice and we're like, no one likes me and <laughs> this church isn't friendly. Well, keep trying. There's no Bible verse that says uh, you, you try once and it doesn't work, jet out. Yeah. Uh, you got to keep trying. Uh, and um, But when you find those people, hold on to them, cherish them, pray with them, weep with them. Uh, you know, if you look at the beginning of the Word of God, He created all of the creation. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. He gets to mankind. He gets to Adam. And He says, it's not good that He is alone. And so He created Eve. Hmm. But, but I think, I think there's, a, there's an element there that's missed. Like the, the main part of that is, is God created ma male and female. And there's this relationship, a helpmate to each other, mutual submission. But one of the things that's missed is a fundamental truth is that Everything in creation was good by itself. It wasn't good that human beings do life alone. Hmm. And so I'm leery of people that 
that put little to no effort into horizontal relationship and they put all the weight and pressure on the vertical relationship with God. Hmm. Um, now granted, if you look at a cross, the vertical part is a lot bigger than the horizontal part, right? And yeah. so our, our, the vast majority of our relationship time should be with the Lord, but he designed us for whatever reason, he designed so much of us to do that life with each other. Um, you know, we, we even read that um, we confess our sins to the Lord and he forgives our sin, but um, we confess our sins to one another that we might be healed. Mm. And so forgiveness is from the Lord. His he healing is still from the Lord, but it's primarily driven through the, through the vehicle of other people. Oh. So God brings mentors, pastors, friends, even people that we get to mentor, but we're still learning from them. It's reciprocal. God brings those people into our lives so that he can heal us. Now, granted, human beings are also the ones that bring the most pain yeah. and hurt. So, I mean, there's there's that too. Like, that's why people want to just go in the woods and build a log cabin, let their bill grow out and just have it be with them and God so they never can get hurt again. But if you do that, you'll never be sharpened. Mm. You will be a dull sword, not ready for battle, spiritual battle. And you'll be good to nobody. You'll help nobody. And you and Jesus might be good, but you will, have, you will have never made a disciple, which is a commandment, not a suggestion. You will have never brought someone from darkness into light, and you'll have never helped people along their journey. You'll be fine, and that's called selfish. Mm. That's called pride. I, this is me, and I'm protected, and I'm good, and I don't ever want to get my heart get hurt again. Iron sharpens iron only happens when iron hits iron and there's sparks that fly. The only way for us to be healed and to be prepared is for us to be in relationship with other people. Mm. And I've, burned, I've gone through a lot of people that have ripped my heart out and I still 100% believe that to the core of who I am. In spite of the, 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 the broken past that I have with people destroying my heart, I still believe one of the primary mechanisms and vehicle for God's healing, God's and God's refinement is through other people. Wow. So, you asked for one, I gave Wonderful. you two. I talked for the 98% of this entire video. I'm Perfect. so sorry, I'm a talker. No, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's almost so like I preach. I, <laughs> I could sense it while you were talking, but thanks so, again for doing it, Pastor absolutely. Jerry. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. 100%. I think we're all going to... Take something great from it. Thank us. you for listening, too. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me ramble on. I, I do appreciate it. We loved it. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs>